So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to come and speak at this prestigious uh, conference. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about neuroendocrine tumours or NET, um, what gastroenterologists and hepatologists need to know uh, and some advances over recent years. It's a, a very large topic and so I'm not going to talk about everything within NET, otherwise we'll be here for days. Um, uh, these are my disclosures. So where do they come from? Neuroendocrine cells, neuroendocrine tumours, they come from neuroendocrine cells. So uh, these are cells, normal physiological cells throughout the body. And they can form glands, like in the parathyroid gland, adrenal gland, but they're diffusely distributed. Um, so within the gastrointestinal tract, throughout the whole gut, pancreas, and some other organs, as you can see. Why have I got this gentleman here? This is uh, um, Professor Orbendorfer, who originally described the cells under the microscope that were looked like it could be cancer, but were behaving quite slowly in almost benign behavior. And he called them carcinoma-like or carcinoid. And that, you, that's where we got the term carcinoid from. However, that's an old term, and it only relates to the carcinoid syndrome, really, where you have a small intestinal net or a lung net that's producing uh, serotonin causing carcinoid syndrome. We now are really should be calling these neuroendocrine neoplasms or neuroendocrine tumors or nets. Um, and uh, you can see three famous people there on the screen, Steve Jobs, um, Aretha Franklin, Erfan Khan, who had uh, various different new endocrine tumors, mainly from the pancreas. The new endocrine tumors, they can arise from different parts of the body and they're quite, can be different diseases. So don't lump them all together. Uh, we have stomach or gastric nets, pancreatic nets, uh, small intestinal nets, rectal nets, uh, bronchial nets, etc. And the incidence of these nets has, uh, is rising and has risen over the last few decades, according to American SEER data and also uh, European and UK data, that the incidence is approaching 9 per 100,000, so more common than most general gastroenterologists would uh, believe. Um, the survival, this is a difficult slide, but the survival is, it can be very varied. So you've got median overall survival on the y-axis and different types of net, so pancreas net and the small intestinal net. And you can, and the, the shades of the graph indicate local, regional, distant disease. And uh, local disease is the darker color. And you can see the survival can be um, for um, almost 240, that's 20 years, for some lung nets, who are, which are localized, and appendiceal nets that can go on for a very long time. But if you've got distant disease or, or um, in the below graph, higher grade disease, then the survival can be uh, a lot shorter. And so the average metastatic small intestinal net, uh, low grade is going to survive, median overall survival is seven years or so. So very varied survival. That's one message to take home. And they, can, they are the most prevalent, second most prevalent gastrointestinal tumour after colorectal cancer. Uh, and that's because of this varied survival and the increase in incidence. So we've got 35 to 50 per 100,000 uh, prevalence, and, and this is rising. Uh, oh, oh, another message to take home is functioning versus non-functioning. So whether the net produces hormones or doesn't. And the majority of gastroenteropancreatic nets, the nets coming arising from the stomach, pancreas, or the rest of the gut, are non-functioning. So we've got pancreatic nets, and some of them will be functioning, a small proportion where you'll have your weird and wonderful syndrome, such as your zollinger ellison syndrome from gastrinoma and your insulinoma. Um, and the majority will be non-functioning, presenting with vague symptoms of weight loss, et cetera. 
And similarly, in the non-pancreatic, particularly small intestinal, some of them will be functioning, and those are the ones that will, be, uh, will produce carcinoid syndrome. Um, but small intestinal net that metastasize, uh, they're a subgroup. And a subgroup of that will have carcinoid syndrome uh, caused by overproduction of serotonin, uh, uh, which will cause flushing diarrhea. And again, a small subgroup of those patients with carcinoid syndrome will have carcinoid heart disease. Um, so the message is that not all patients with NETS will have carcinoid syndrome. Um, not all patients with metastatic small intestinal nets will have carcinoid syndrome. So it's a subgroup of a subgroup of a subgroup with the majority being non-functioning. But for those patients that do present with carcinoid syndrome, they will have a classical, a dry flush. So not a wet flush, which could be confused with menopausal, dry flush and a secretory diarrhea. And they can also have cardiac findings such as uh, valvular uh, fibrosis. Uh, these other symptoms, such as weeds, are quite uh, rare. So we asked patients before they were diagnosed with NET what were they being treated for by surgeons and gastroenterologists. And a uh, majority of patients uh, presented with IBS or Crohn's disease. Uh, and that's what they were, were, were told they had. And if we look at our Welsh data, uh, the majority of patients who presented with symptoms, so three, uh, two thirds presented with chronic symptoms, had abdominal pain and diarrhea, which overlaps with IBS, especially if you have a, a normal colonoscopy. 10% will present incidentally. These are the specialities that end up diagnosing your endocrine tumors from the gastroenterological pancreatic uh, tract. And you can see the vast majority will have a GI speciality. So a GI surgical speciality or gastroenterologist or hepatologist. Um, and the important thing is to make sure we investigate a particular patients. Now you may think that chromogranin A is a good blood test, but it's not very good blood test when you're diagnosing. It's 60% 60, 60 sensitivity. Uh, it is a good prognostic mar marker when you have a confirmed neuroendocrine tumor or a strongly suspected neuroendocrine tumor on radiology. But look at this box. You've got a lot of false positives chronic PPI use, atrophic gastritis, uh, kidney impairment, cirrhosis, etc. So the specificity is actually quite low and it's not raised in small volume, neuroendocrine tumors or rectal net or, uh, or poorly differentiated neuroendocrine cancers. Imaging is going to give you the diagnosis. So a CT or an MRI will reveal the primary or, uh, or distant metastases in 90% of patients. This is a classical story of a 57-year-old female who had six years of intermittent loose stool, poorly localized abdominal pain. She had a normal colonoscopy and ultrasound was labeled with the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. She was referred twice through gastroenterology and surgical clinics for diarrhea and given the usual IBS treatment. I had very mild weight loss, one kilogram, but recently stable. She had an, another colonoscopy because people were worried. And then uh, she had another primary care, secondary care referral where CT colonogram demonstrated uh, this uh, mesenteric mass with some calcification and a stellate appearance, as you can see with some desmoplasia, which is quite a classical appearance for a mesenteric node, which contains a um, local metastasis from a small intestinal net. And the patient had a normal 25-hour urinary 5-HIA, but a slightly raised chromogranin A. Um, the patient and had liver metastasis and had a biopsy, and the pathology is the most important thing because that can determine the prognosis and what you tell the patient and uh, how you end up treating them. Uh, first of all, this confirms the diagnosis, but the stain here is something called T67, which is a proliferation marker, uh, which is really important to identify web, how quickly the, the, or how aggressive the neuroendocrine neoplasm is. 
So the pathologist uh, report is really important and you might end up having a biopsy, whether it's from the liver or the stomach. And I'm not going to cover stomach or gastric nets or rectal nets because that's a separate talk. But if you have a pathology report and it says a neuroendocrine neoplasm or neuroendocrine tumor, the, the two key things are differentiation and the key 67 staining. So if it's well differentiated, which is the, the most more common, uh, then they're very well behaving. If it's poorly differentiated, then that's very aggressive and you need urgent oncology intervention. And the key 67 staining, this, this being 6%, is an indicator of how quickly the tumor is growing and the grade. And so this is uh, ENET uh, Society guidelines, um, also WHO now, and um, uh, we determine grade according to the key 67. So less than 3%, it's low grade, Above 20%, it's high grade, and you've got the, the middle uh, being G2, grade 2. And these are usually well-differentiated nets, and the higher the grade, the worse the prognosis. Uh, but within the high grade, so greater than 20%, C67, you can also get poorly differentiated uh, tumours, which we call neuroendocrine carcinomas, and those are, are, are very aggressive. But the well-differentiated nets tend to be slow growing, but the higher the grade, the worse the prognosis. And grade is prognostic, as you can see from this Kaplan-Meier survival curve. Importantly, somatostatin receptors are receptors expressed by most nets, and we, use, we have used these for diagnosis and treatment over a number of decades, the SSTR type 2 being the most common on, on the surface of the neuroendocrine cells. So we have access to oxytide scans for many decades, and that's the uh, indium labeled oxytide uh, molecule, which is injected in, into the venous system and radioactive uh, labeling of neuroendocrine tumors occurs. And you can see some nice pictures here, although they are low, sens but low sensitivity and poorly differentiated neuroendocrine neoplasms and, and small volume disease. So they'll end up only picking up large uh, disease such as greater than 15 millimeters or so. Um, FDG PET scan, your normal PET scan, is only useful for aggressive cancers. So for your colorectal cancer and your breast cancer, et cetera. And then next, they're only useful in the higher grade net or the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas. For most low-grade, well-differentiated nets, which is the majority, FDG PET is not useful. Uh, gallium dose take PET scan, which is available in a number of different countries, is more sensitive than the oxytide scan, and that's just a gallium 68 labeled oxytide molecule, which again goes uh, lights up any somatostatin receptor positive areas such as these liver metastases in this particular patient. We looked at patients in our series uh, where uh, diagnostic labels had been incorrectly labeled and, and we were um, so IBS and IBD um, and we went on to a series of education and transformation of the service uh, for Wales neuroendocrine tumours. And as you can see, the number of mislabeled with IBS ha is reduced uh, almost half compared, for, uh, compared to before our transformation in 2017. There's a slight increase in IBD as, an, as a, a mislabel, but we are uh, currently working on that. Um, and the key here is that awareness and education and amongst gastroenterologists and surgeons, which is what we've done in Wales. Um, additionally, gastroenterologists should be involved because even when nets are treated with metastatic disease, particularly with octotine injections, you can have a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms which need to be addressed, such as with um, pan for pancreatic ex exocrine insufficiency or following a small bowel resection and having bile acid diarrhea or a lot of people having small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, so through our initiatives and focusing on patient reported outcome measures, we have halved the diagnosis time in, in Wales uh, from a median of nine months to four months. 
and we've also focused on those areas of managing GI symptoms and uh, GI symptom scores and quality of life scores have uh, improved over this period of time. And this is through education and awareness um, uh, for gastroenterologists and surgeons and having a gastroenterology-led net service. I can't go into the details of treatment as there's just not enough time, but surgery is the ultimate cure and for, as for any other cancer. But with NET, because they're slow growing nature, even in the metastatic setting, one can entertain curative surgery or you can do bulking surgery, even with liver metastases, particularly in the younger uh, age group. Um, the control of tumor growth in advanced or metastatic disease, we've got a number of options, but the, the majority have somatostatin analogs, especially if you've got positive oxytide or gallium PET scans. We have some other drugs available to us, which sometimes are given by gastroenterologists or sometimes given by oncologists, depending where in the world you are. And we have local regional therapy similar to hepatocellular carcinoma with transarterial embolization, uh, radiofrequency ablation. And then we have some uh, more advanced or novel therapies, uh, which are radio labeled octreotide. So somatostatin analogs, octreotide or lanreotide controls the, do two things. They control the growth of the tumor that expresses somatostatin receptor. And also they, inhibit the secretion of the serotonin or any other hormone produced by that net. And so with carcinoid syndrome, for example, somatostatin analogs uh, can reduce the amount of facial flushing and diarrhea. Um, on, uh, just to note, there are, uh, as a new therapy uh, we've had in the UK for a number of decades, but been licensed throughout the world in the last few years, and uh, this is radioactive somatostatin analog or lutecera, which is lutetium uh, attached with somatostatin analog, and that's gives in, uh, given as a, an infusion intravenously usually, uh, which carries the beta-emitting particles straight to wherever the somatostatin receptor nets are. And so that's a, a, a more recent advancement. Um, so uh, also a recent drug, which is used for diarrhea refractory to somatostatin analogs um, in carcinoid syndrome is telocrostat. And this is a tryptophan hydroxylase inhibitor. So tryptophan is metabolized to 5-HTP, which essentially makes up uh, serotonin. And this is overproduced in neuroendocrine tumors. And we measure it in the 24-hour unit collection of 5-HIA. For those patients with carcinoid syndrome and overproduction of serotonin, again, this is a subgroup. If the, the somatostat analogs, the octreotide or lanreotide injections every four weeks has a, uh, is not, no longer working for those hormonal symptoms, then telocrostat can be used and it's a tablet. And it has shown in clinical trials to reduce the amount of diarrhea. And I have a feeling it can also help uh, secrete diarrhea uh, for other causes, but this is its license. Um, so this is a new advancement. And I've gone through a whistle-stop tour of uh, neuroendocrine tumors from presentation to diagnosis within gastroenterology and GI surgery, and also some of the prognosis and treatments. Um, but this is a, a tumor which really is unusual and requires the involvement of a number of different specialities. We have nurse specialists, who are truly really crucial, um, as well as coordinate, MBT coordinators. But as you can see, we need a, quite a, a, a varied amount of specialists, including oncology, endocrinology, gastroenterology, nuclear medicine, liver surgery, pancreas surgery, GI surgery, etc. So um, it's a truly multidisciplinary uh, team that is required for endocrine tumors and, and that's uh, my take-home uh, message uh, thank you very much and i'm uh, happy to take any questions